Welcome to the Dr. Dad's Podcast, where a naturopath and chiropractor come together each week to share lifestyle, medicine, health advice, and inspiring interviews with some of the top experts in health and wellness, bringing you the latest in nutrition, exercise, ancient healing, toxins and detox, your microbiome, mindset, hormones, brain, and much more. Stay tuned. We're going to teach you how to experience growth daily. Good afternoon, evening, or morning, wherever you are. Uh, thanks so much for tuning into the Dr. Dad's podcast. I'm here with my main man, Dr. David Wardy. Uh, David, not a good day for you, bud. I, you know, I got on the call, and usually it's roses and rainbows with David and I. We get on the call, and, and unfortunately, um, you had to say you got bu- goodbye to someone today. So, do you want to share a little yeah. bit about that, bud? You know, it's it's one of those things we have. We started with six uh, dogs when me and Clarissa got married. And we had to say bye to one in December, our Frenchie. And, you know, they're all very close to, to the same age. And so, I mean, they've lived full lives. So today we had to say bye to Toby, our Maltese. He was 16. Uh, you know, we'd kind of seen it coming for like the last six months. But he let us know yesterday that it was time. And I like Clarissa to make the calls on, on the dogs and the animals in the household. So this morning we had to go and take care of that. And the whole family went and went through that experience but you know it's it's tough man because they're like they're part of the family right and definite definitely feel that change and that shift of energy in the household when you get back to so and the other dogs can they're, they're noticing you know as well but i'm good man it's just you know it's part of life and it's one of those things where we know it's coming down the road when we when we start raising these these fur babies over, over time and uh but it's never easy man you know no oh, totally and it's, um, you know, just given the nature of the, the discussion we're going to have today, which is all about saving animals and doing what we can to, you know, live a future where there's less harm for these, you know, super important creatures that are in our lives, you know, whether they're, they're pets or we just get to hang out with them for a little while or they're, you know, they're animals that, that are raised on a farm. I mean, it's, it's an interesting experience to be in relationship with these creatures. So, oh, yeah. And they bring so much, right, to our lives and. And rich yeah. our lives. I think that's that's the hardest part, man. It's just you, you 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 sit there and you think about all the memories you had with them and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. and so yeah. yeah, yeah. Let's get into it, man. Yeah, let's, let's get. Ready. Well, we got a special guest today on the topic of uh, animals and our future, um, whether it be in the next couple of years to you know you know not too distant future, really. So uh, the gentleman we have today is a uh, incredible human. Uh, I'm got through his book. It's called Clean Meat. His name is Paul Shapiro. And honestly, this this conversation of meat is near and dear to me because, as you know, David, I've been a vegetarian for a number of years, uh, probably about 12 or 13 years. And then we had our second child. And once our second child came into the world, he kind of caused some disruption. He he became a bit of a meat eater. And, and Sonia, my wife, and my older son were just totally adverse to, to not having that in our lives. And we recognized that our boy just did a little bit better emotionally, energetically, just, uh, he was more calm when he had more animal protein. And so I've sort of loosely invited it back into my own, uh, diet. So here we are, this, this gentleman, Paul Shapiro has wrote a book called clean meat, which is really about disrupting the, the paradigm really of what our, of our relationship to animal products and what could a future look like where we sort of move away from these modern farming practices that we've all come to know and, and uh, having different solutions for entering into a vegetarian or maybe still a consumption of meat, but not in the way that you expect. And I'm not going to say more than that because I want Paul to share his story uh, about how he got into uh, the, this, this process and actually becoming such a huge passion of it. So welcome so much, uh, Paul. Thanks for being here. Hey, thanks so much, Nick and David. I'm really sorry for your loss, man. I uh, oh, I have, you, man. I have um, been a part of the uh, humane euthanasia of a number of dogs and cats in my life, and I know how hard it is. And my wife and I have a dog who we love very much, and uh, she regularly remarks that she is not prepared for his death. And you know, this dog is only three years old, but <laughs> we love him so much, and uh, hopefully, you know, he'll live another decade or so. But uh, she already has warned me that when he dies, that she will be like completely destroyed. 
Uh, so I feel your pain and I'm sorry to, to hear about that, but I'm happy to be on the show with you guys because uh, I know that you all are both dads and therefore you really probably have a lot of dad jokes. And I can assure you that I, while not having any human children of my own, have been known to tell more dads than the average, add more dad jokes than the average dad. So maybe we'll get into that today. We'll see. Okay, By the way, so. did you guys hear why it didn't work out between the chemistry professor and the um, oh man, I already screwed this up. Oh my god, <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfect dad joke uh, already. That's, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's, uh, that's I'm, I'm so humiliated by this, it's horrible. Uh, my self perception is that I really enjoy jokes, but I, I really screwed that up. All right, so did you hear why it didn't work out between the physics professor and the biology professor? They had no chemistry. Ha uh-huh. ha, there you oh, go. Nice. Yeah. Very yeah, good. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for humoring me. I appreciate it. I, I, I was I was gonna tell a, a joke about the periodic table of elements, but I, I thought it might be out of my element. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Back to back, what a way to enter into a podcast. Uh, I like it, man. Thank, was a good one. thank you. I, I, I had to perform at least well on one of them. So. Yeah, yeah. Those are good, man. Those are good. Second one was out of the park. Yeah. Thank you. I, I yeah. had too much stage fright on the first one, but don't worry, I'll loosen up. <laughs> oh, it's amazing. Paul, you, you do have such a you know, you you've got your hands in so many different fields from, you know, advocacy to, you know, just understanding more about the industry. You know, tell us a little bit about your background, your story and what brought you into really wanting to investigate uh, clean meat in more detail. Uh, sure, Nick. So, you know, look, first and foremost, the planet just isn't getting any bigger. Humanity's footprint on the planet is getting a lot bigger, but the planet itself is just not getting any bigger. And one of the primary ways that we leave that footprint is through our food print, principally in the amount of meat that we eat. So I don't really think it's much of a secret anymore that it just takes a lot of land and a lot of water and a lot of greenhouse gas emissions and more to raise and slaughter billions of animals for food. Um, The problem is that even though it's extremely resource intensive to raise all these animals, and it causes a huge amount of animal cruelty and more, Meat demand's going up, not down. The total human population is going up, and therefore meat demand is going up. And, you know, we're not going to be farming the moon. We're not going to be farming Mars. We have one celestial body to farm. And so if meat demand is going up and the planet isn't getting bigger, like, what are we going to do? We're just going to deforest the rest of the planet? I mean, the number one cause of deforestation on the planet Earth right now is, is, cause, is uh, cutting down trees to make room for meat production. Number one, to, uh, for grazing cattle and growing crops to feed to farm animals. So... You know, I I just have worried that there's not a way to sustainably feed humanity into the future if we are continuing to increase the number of animals we raise for food. It's terrible for the animals themselves. It's terrible also for other wild animals. And it's really bad for humanity. And so I've wondered, like, you know, what is the best way to change, to rectify this problem? So, you know, you could just expect that maybe people will just become vegetarians. And I'd be thrilled if people wanted to eat rice and bean burritos and lentil soup and hummus. Those are all foods that I love. I wish more people would eat like that. But people seem to really want to eat meat. I mean, I, I also wish that people would be happy to walk and bike more, but they seem to want to drive. And so the idea is that we got to make cars that don't rely on fossil fuels. Well, if people want to eat meat, I really think that we need to create meat experiences that don't involve animals. And so that may seem crazy, but the idea of running cars without fossil fuels also seemed crazy. And now people are doing it. And so I became highly interested in the topic of what's called sometimes clean meat or cultivated meat, which is real meat. It's not an alternative to meat. It's real actual animal meat. It's just grown from animal cells rather than from animal slaughter. And I became interested in this really around the turn of the century when NASA funded some research that Uh, resulted in the scientists in New York state actually growing fish meat out of the fish's body. They grew actual fish muscle, and that's what meat is, outside of the body. And um, a friend of mine at the time, he he informed me about this. His name is Jason Matheny. And he informed me about this, and he ended up writing a paper in 2005 on what it could look like to scale up that type of meat production system. And, you know, that was mind-blowing to me. I thought, wow, can you imagine if we could make meat without animals? And so you fast forward then to 2013, and uh, the very first ever burger was debuted that was made from cultivated beef cells. So they weren't coming, uh, you don't have to slaughter an animal, they were just growing from the cells of the cow to cow. And that was really mind blowing to me that somebody's making burgers this way, but it's still very expensive. There was nobody trying to commercialize this. It was really an academic pursuit. 
Then in the end of 2015, when the very first company was founded to commercialize cultivated meat, that's when I thought, hey, you know, somebody needs to tell this story. And I thought, you know, I'm not a microbiologist. I'm not a tissue engineer. I don't have millions of dollars to invest like a venture capitalist. But like, I just didn't think of myself as really being a part of the industry as much as I saw myself wanting to cheerlead for this industry and tell their story. To tell the story of the investors, the entrepreneurs, the scientists who are all racing to commercialize the world's first slaughter-free meat. And that's why I decided to write the book, Clean Meat. So the book's called Clean Meat, How Growing Meat Without Animals Will Revolutionize Dinner in the World. And it led to a whole uh, bunch of outcomes in my life that I never would have expected either. Yeah, what, what an amazing journey that's been for you. And, and it was so interesting to hear your, your perspective along the way as you were, you know, interviewing and talking to some of these different, I mean, industry disruptors, whether it be like Modern Meadows to the... Um, so I can't remember all of them. There's there's quite a few different ones, but uh, what's the one that that uh, did the mayo and then disrupted the mayo into? Uh, yeah. So at the time of the, at the time I wrote the book, uh, where the book came out in 2018, and uh, they were called Hampton Creek at that time, right. but they've yeah. since they've since changed their name to Eat Just. And so Eat Just now not only is selling a, a lot of uh, plant based egg product. But they also are selling real cultivated meat in Singapore. So they're selling chicken nuggets that are made from chicken cells from a chicken who was alive when the biopsy was taken from the chicken's feather. And I mean, like they took meat out of the chicken. They just took a feather that had fallen off of the chicken and took stem cells from that feather and uh, then grew chicken nuggets. And that the, the cell line was created to continue making chicken nuggets from it. Yeah, that's amazing. So, I mean, and those are just two of a number of different companies that are they're doing this, uh, you know, disruptive technology to you know, really transform our planet and, and our ability to, um, you know, sustain ourselves with with the growing number of people. So, I, I'm, I'm I want to pause here because I want I want David because David he's a Texan through and through. <laughs> There's meat down there in incredible amounts. And uh, I'm so curious, David, because David and I haven't really chatted about this uh, in great detail yet. So I kind of wanted to hear first impressions from you, David, and then let's get into some more of the questions. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, like Paul was saying, I remember watching some documentary probably maybe like five years ago about them showing how they were going to start cultivating meat products from this type of cell stuff he's talking about in the labs. And I understand where he's at as far as like, the earth's not getting any bigger. There's too many people, right? And we just keep expanding and multiplying. And I mean, we have to look at these, you know, down the road type possibilities of there being food shortages and, and, and finding other ways, you know, to, to find the needs of the population. But then also, like you guys are saying, taking care of animals and things like this. But for me, man, it's just so foreign. I mean, I'm listening to you guys talk right now and, you know, I, I see ranchers, they come in, they own cattle ranches. Like I talk to them all the time about when they harvest their meat. I mean, I was just talking to a, a patient of mine yesterday about how much meat they can get from one Angus cow. I mean, we're just having a conversation, right? So it's just a normal part of, of kind of how it is down here in the South and, 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 you know, my environment. But then to hear about like, Oh, we're going to eat meat one day and we're going to grow it in the lab. I mean, for me, it's just a little far off. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. Like it, it I, I don't see, I see the need, but I don't see where part of the population is going to jump on board and want to eat lab grown meat. I mean, I'm, I'm being very, very honest. I know there's a need for it, but uh, there's got to be a threshold just like with electric cars, right? We're in gas and we're trying to make our way towards electric and it's going to probably take like 20, 30 more years before this happens. Right. And I know we're trying to make it there, but, um, I don't know, man. Like I, I've been thinking about this for a while and it's just kind of like, I don't know if, is this going to be a delicacy one day where you, you get the real thing and then most of the food that we're eating off the shelf is going to come from the lab. I mean, that's kind of where, where I'm at on all yeah, this. Yeah. So I, I, I don't know that I necessarily, David, refer to it as a lab. I mean, you think about a lot of food today, like let's say you take beer and you walk into a beer brewery, they've got microbiologists, they have big steel bioreactors humming away, but you don't really call it lab-grown beer. It, you know, it's just right. a product of, of, of fermentation that comes from a facility that, no, it doesn't look pastoral like a farm. I mean, it looks like you know a big factory, um, but most food is produced in factories. Uh, that's just the way things are today. Um, but I guess I would put it like this. So think about it like 
you take the case of ice, you know, for thousands of years, the only way that we had to get ice was out of nature. So there was a big industry in the 19th century where people would harvest ice from frozen northern lakes and rivers and put it in insulated boats and ship it all around the world. And then enter the advent of refrigeration. And all of a sudden, you have a way to make ice, real ice. But instead of getting it from nature, you're getting it through human-made technology. And at the time, the ice barons were livid. And there were ice barons, and they were very livid over what they referred to as artificial ice. And they railed against it, saying that this was unnatural, it went against God, it was unsafe, it could sicken your kids, and so on. And then you fast forward to today, and we all have artificial ice makers in our homes. We call them freezers. We don't think there was anything unnatural about it at all. In fact, we probably would never want to live without one. And most of us would not want to go back to the days where in order to get ice, we had to pull frozen water out of lakes. But it's still ice. It's still the same thing. It's just made through technology. And the same is so here. For thousands of years, the only way we had to get meat was out of animals' bodies. Now, however, we have a human-made technology that is allowing us to make real meat without the animals. And I think that in the future, people will be quite glad that we don't have to do it the old way, that we don't have to commit violence against animals, that we don't have to destroy the planet and put ourselves at risk of more pandemics and all the other ills that are associated with raising and slaughtering animals for food. And so my belief is that future generations will actually be quite shocked at how we treated animals in our era. And they'll be very grateful that they are no longer reliant on the exploitation of animals to feed themselves just in the same way that we're grateful that we don't have to slaughter whales to light our homes anymore. You go back to the 19th century, you probably would be lighting your home with whale oil. Today, we don't do that, of course. We use electricity. And thankfully, we do, because whales are better off. We don't need to go out and massacre whales in order to light our homes. But that used to be the way most homes were lit. Now, we have new human-made technologies that enable us to illuminate rooms without whale killing. So I think this is just one more natural step in our move toward utilizing technology to displace animal exploitation. Well, and I'm all with you for the exploitation. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm hundred percent there. Um, but I think we're a little far fetched man, between water and oil that we use for things to animal tissue and growing it in a lab. Like I'm with you on like, we make beer in a lab. But there's a difference when an animal is out in the pasture eating grass and that's how the cells are growing and proliferating in the body of an animal. And then we harvest the meat versus you're doing this in a lab. So you're gonna have to get me from point A to B of yeah. when we're in the lab and you're growing these tissues and we're cultivating and making what you call real meat. Explain to me what that looks like from a nutrition type standpoint of when we're going to eat. Sure. Yeah, sure. I would love to do that, David. So, you know, first, if you think about it, let me just put it to you this way. First and foremost, when you were talking about seeing animals out there grazing on pasture, that's less than 1% of animals who we raise for food. More than 99% of animals who we raise for food never see the light of day. You don't see them because you don't go inside of factory farms. But more than 9 billion, with a B, 9 billion chickens are inside of these windowless warehouses where they live wing to wing in their own feces. They don't see the, sun, the sunlight at all. Uh, they're pumped full of antibiotics. They grow so fast that many of them can't even take more than a few steps before they collapse underneath their unnatural bulk. And when it comes time for slaughter, most people don't want to hear what happens. And so like, th that's the reality of how most animals, in fact, nearly all animals are raised for food today. They're not out on pasture for the most part. They're inside of factory farms. And so if cultivated meat were only to displace this type of factory farm meat and people were still buying from pasture raised animals, it would be a tremendous advancement for the moral progress of our civilization. Now, at the same time, I do think that there will be a lot of people who will be quite pleased that they can get meat without slaughtering animals, even if the animals weren't being tormented their whole lives, they still might have disease about uh, slaughtering them. And I think that there'll be lots of people who are happy, um, who are happy about that. But let's talk about the safety of the products, as you were alluding to, because if you think about raw meat today, you're really warned to treat it almost like toxic waste. You know, in the supermarket, if raw meat touches your other, you don't want it to touch your other groceries. You have to segregate it out in the basket. Uh, if it comes home, if raw meat touches your counter, you have to disinfect your counter. If it's on your hands, you got to wash your hands. But there's a reason why we have to treat raw meat as if it were almost like toxic waste, and that's because there's feces on it. So E. coli, salmonella, campylobacter, these are intestinal pathogens that can sicken us if we don't cook the crap out of the meat, literally. Because literally cook the crap out of the meat. 
Um, but with clean meat, you don't have to worry so much about intestinal pathogens because there's no intestines at all. You're just growing the muscle that people actually want. So it's a much safer product from a food safety perspective than the current meat products that we already have. I agree with you that I don't think that these technologies are going to displace all animal use. I mean, a hundred, more than a hundred years after the introduction of the car, some people still ride around in horse-drawn carriages. But I do think that we will see a major displacement of uh, huge portions of the animal slaughter industry uh, that will be beneficial for the planet and for animals as well and for humanity at the same time. And I think it's beneficial for us, not just because it's like the moral benefit of, of not harming others, which I think is important in and of itself. But even if you look at the pandemic, right now, the, you, you know, the United Nations put out a report. It's called Preventing the Next Pandemic. You can go look it up. And at, in this report, Preventing the Next Pandemic, the United Nations talks about the top reasons that we might have another pandemic. And number one on the UN list is increasing demand for animal protein. Number two on their list is intensification of agriculture. So confining more and more animals in tighter and tighter spaces. Number three on their list is the bushmeat trade. So killing wildlife for meat. So the number one, two, and three reasons the United Nations says that we may have another pandemic are all relating to humanity's desire to eat meat. People really want to eat meat. We've got to figure out a way to give it to them, to satiate humanity's meat tooth without animals. And I think that we can do that with technology. You know, it's not going to displace all, all uh, conventional meat production, but I do think it'll go a long way toward building a better world. Yeah, the, the things that you brought, brought up, David, are definitely the things that are on my mind that, you know, I think of, you know, my son and, and the little meat that we do consume in our, in our lives now um, as a result of, you know, just seeing a, a different boy uh, when he's got some animal protein in him. Uh, when I first when I first started reading his book, I'm like, there's no way I'm going to get on board with Paul. Like, I just I just don't see this happening. It just doesn't it doesn't make sense. And, and I love the dialogue that you two just have, because that's that what you just shared is exactly, I think, what most people go through. It's exactly the same thing as what I was going through. And and to, to see this play out over the small conversation. But really, it's like it's something that's been playing out for a while. And there's all these sort of graduations of what we get you know, acclimatized to and, and the fact that, you know, where are for me, I think where, where I first saw the, the real entry point, which you laid out in your book so well, was to, to really appreciate that we can actually move this into the leather industry. Because I think yeah. that people would really get that they were like, we don't have to kill animals to build furniture or make sneakers or car furniture, like, what a what a great place to disrupt and, and sort of get people acclimatized to it. And, and I th think that the way you presented that in your book made it easier to digest, you know, no pun intended. And and then we start to what see was some it? these what yeah. Was there no was there no pun intended or was the pun intended? Uh, maybe, yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, okay, all right, all right. But talk about that was. because I think that that's super important. Is that like let's get okay, we have some technology now that, that's capable of some incredible things. Um but why don't we start it over here first? And so that people can get comfortable with that. I think that that was a really genius strategy that some of these companies uh, moved into. Yeah, sure, Nick. So if you think about it, you know, if there are some people who may have discomfort with putting cultivated meat into their mouth, well, they have as much discomfort putting it, let's say, on their wrist in the form of a wristwatch or on their back in the form of a leather coat. Because we can grow real leather without cows as well. In fact, it's a lower technological hurdle to do so. It's easier to grow a 2D thing like a sheet of leather than a 3D thing like a piece of like a chunk of meat. So we are now uh, finding that actually we can create real leather without animals easier than we can create meat. And I'm very proud to say that when my book, Queen Meat, was published, the first copy off of the press was actually bound in lab grown leather. It was the first and still only book ever bound in lab grown leather. And wow. we, we put it up for auction and it sold for $13,000. Uh, all proceeds went to the Good Food Institute, which is a, char a charity that advances this space. And uh, still to this day is the only book that has ever been bound in lab grown leather. And it was really cool. Like Newsweek did a big story on it. It was really awesome when that happened. That's so cool. So... Yeah, well, go ahead, David. Uh, well, I can see that, right? Like, and I love where this is going. Is 
there's got to be some stepping stones here to, to I think, help humanity just get more comfortable. Because, I mean, if you're not, you know, like, I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not a vegan, I eat meat, I don't have a problem with it, you know, I'm not going to lie. Um, but the reality is that that's a big step to go from, like, I eat the real thing to I'm going to eat something that was grown in a lab. So I think there needs it, to be some yeah. stepping stones like that for people. Yeah. And yeah, this isn't no, everybody, I, I know. right? This is just, yeah, no. I mean, just a, 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 right. I mean, we have like a standard deviation from these people who are going to be purists, and then we're going to have these deviations, right? But the reality right. is, is, like, you're going to have to have stepping stones to help people just get there, you know? Right. And, yeah. Well, I definitely agree with what you just said, David. We do need stepping stones, but I will just push back a little and say it is the real thing. It is real meat. It would be like saying like the ice in your freezer isn't the real thing because it was made by human technology or like saying a digital photo isn't the real thing because you didn't have to take it into a dark room and expose the negative and put all the chemicals on it. It's still a photo. Like it still is helping you to capture your memory, but it's just not done in the way that it used to be done. Um, you know, when we talk on our cell phones, we don't say, oh, this is a fake landline, right? We accept that this is a telephone. Uh, this, the, 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 the thing is that these new technologies enable us to do the same thing, to have the same experience, except way more efficiently. So whether it's using a car instead of a horse, or whether it's using a light bulb instead of whale oil, or whether it's taking a digital photo rather than a print photo and so on, like you're not getting a fake photo or a fake phone. It is the real thing. And you get the experience of eating meat without all the downsides. So in all fairness, Paul, but it's not living tissue what you're talking about. It is living tissue. Um, it is just not come out of a slaughtered animal's body. So right. I, I, do th I, I do think that some people may say like, hey, I will only eat meat if an animal was slaughtered for it. But I think that most people will say that they're happy to enjoy it if it tastes good, is safe to eat, and, and is cost effective for them. It's kind of like having light. You know, you walk into a room, you flip on a light switch, like nobody is thinking oh, is this light coming from coal or oil or wind or solar? Like you just want an illuminated room. That's the experience you're after is illuminating the room. And when people eat meat, most people aren't thinking, ah, I'm so glad an animal was slaughtered for this. They don't think about it at all. And if they do think about an animal, they might actually prefer that an animal not have been harmed for it. And so I agree with you, David. I do think there are some people who are going to put their foot down and say, listen, I demand an animal be slaughtered for me. But I think most people will just be happy to have that experience of meat consumption without the need to harm animals in the process. So if I, if I could jump in here, because I, I'm sort of trying to paint a picture of like where David and I would come from, from a purist point of view, you know, like we're, we're big against like factory farm or all that stuff. Like if someone's going to get, I, we would like to say qualitarian, be a qualitarian Maybe you can get wild. Maybe you can you can know the farmer. David has access to, to farmers that he knows really well. So through this lens through which, David, I, I'm, I'm speaking for you a little bit, but also my okay. process and how we speak to patients, is that we're looking for, you know, an animal that's, you know, got its feet on the soil. It's getting the electromagnetics from the planet. It's eating this really beautiful grass. And it's and there's this whole, like, energy and, and vitality that, that, that comes into this animal. And, and I'm making it sound really rosy and beautiful because, obviously, the, the next step is they get slaughtered, which is, you know, horrible for that animal. So I think that – and maybe is that part of where your question's coming from, David? Like, just this whole yeah, I mean, building yeah. and there's more to just and that the animal to me, than that's, just the meat? And that, to me, is living tissue. That's, that's meat. So it's, it's a hard jump for me to say, well, it's still living tissue, but we're growing it in a lab and it tastes the same. And, and you're right, Paul, I don't think there's going to be a lot of people that really care because they just want to eat the meat. Right. But then like Nick is saying for people like me, I have a somewhat of a relationship of where my food comes from. And, and I want to know the source is like when Nick is saying from, and we don't just buy yeah. crap that you buy in the grocery store. Right. Like there's a lot that yeah. into what I eat and what I put in my body. So, Thank you. Thanks for that, Nick. But yeah, I mean, yeah. That's, kind of, that's kind of the lens I'm looking through. And, and again, I'm not, I'm with you in many ways. Mm -hmm. There's just a hard jump for me to jump from this. Like it's the same thing when for me, it, it's just not, man, I don't see it being the same. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I totally hear you, David. And I guess like one, if people are saying, Hey, I'm not going to buy factory farm meat. I'm only going to buy meat from animals who are like out there raised on pasture. You know, that's a much better thing to do than what most people currently do. 
Again, more than 99% of meat, though, is not coming from those type of systems that you're referring to. The type of systems that you're referring to are far more expensive than the conventional meat that most people are buying at fast food restaurants and big box grocery stores, which is nearly all meat that's sold. Um, and it's, it's, it's much more expensive. So like, it is a solution for people who can afford it. But for most people, um, that's just not going to be like, they, they may just, they may say, Hey, I, when I eat meat, that's what I'm going to eat, but I'm just going to eat a lot less meat. And that's great. It would be wonderful for people to eat less meat. That's a wonderful outcome. Um, but I do think that most people like you correctly pointed out, are just going to be happy to eat it. And I think that as time goes by and we reduce our reliance on, on the, uh, slaughter of animals. I suspect that people are going to have to um, really think hard about how much they want to just like what makes it worth it for them to cause so much suffering. You know, like I like I think about today, like if you saw somebody whipping a horse mercilessly in the street, you would be horrified by it. Uh, yet that was the norm. You know, just over 100 years ago, that's what and that's how our entire society moved. You would hear the cracks of whips all day long in cities like New York and Boston and so on. That was just what you heard all day long. Most people that wouldn't want to whip horses anymore, uh, they would say, hey, I, I don't feel comfortable whipping a horse. Um, and they're glad that they don't have to do that to get around anymore. I suspect that when people are offered a choice for a product that tastes the same, but has a lower environmental footprint, and you don't have to put a knife into an animal's throat, people will think, you know, maybe it's not so bad. Uh, on that note, I know I, this is what I was thinking too. Like, what, what chemistry... And I don't know if you're going to have all the specifics, but like, what are some of the growth mediums? Like, you know, thinking from that qualitarian or purist point of view, what if there's like antibiotics or chemicals that are going into the meat that's growing in the lab? Like, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, obviously there's, there's, um, sure. you know, trademarks and stuff like that, but, but let's talk a little bit about that because I know people are going to go, okay, well, I need to see the long-term studies. What's it like eating this kind of food yeah. and what's the outcome in my body? Wow. You know, those kind of, yeah. those kind of things. Totally, Nick. So uh, first of all, let's just point out, like, you don't need antibiotics to do this. But second, you do have rampant antibody use, antibiotic use in the meat industry today. 70% of all the antibiotics that are produced in the United States are fed to farm animals, not because they're sick, but to promote rapid growth and to promote weight gain and so on. Like, that's where this is a huge portion of why we have a threat of antibiotic resistance. It's a lot of antibiotic residues on the meat itself. Like, if we're concerned about antibiotics, yeah, the best thing to do would be to get rid of animals from the meat industry and to go to a, a animal free meat industry. Um, but yeah, look, of course, you know, if you're waiting on long term studies, you'll be waiting a long time because, uh, you know, this meat uh, has not been in existence for a very long time. And I think there may be, you know, people who feel like that. They're like, oh, I want to wait decades before I, I see this. Most people, though, I think don't require uh, that steep mountain of proof. I mean, there are some people who, you know, uh, didn't want to get vaccinated for that very reason. They said, well, you know, mRNA vaccines haven't been around for that long or whatever. I don't even know if that's true, but you know, that is the claim, at least. And there are some people who didn't want to get vaccinated, and that's fine. You know, they, you know nobody's going to force you to get vaccinated. Um, but the science does seem to show that it's safe. And hundreds of millions of people got this vaccine, and at least so far, don't seem to have suffered from it for the most part. Um, and of course, you never know, like maybe 10 years down the line, you see something, but it doesn't appear to be evidence of that yet. And it'll be up to the regulators like at the FDA to determine what is safe and what's not. And so far, the, uh, the food safety regulators in only one country have approved cultivated meat. That's in Singapore. But in the United States, the FDA has not approved it for sale yet. And um, I do think that they will, but we'll find out. Um, it's not, but once it is, I mean, my presumption is that the FDA is a pretty rigorous, not presumption, my knowledge is that the FDA is a pretty rigorous process for determining what food is safe and what isn't. And when we know that the meat that we eat today is not good for us, so we know eating a diet higher in meat is associated with increased cancer risk, increased heart disease risk, increased diabetes risk, and more, I think, well, you know, people still eat it even though we know that a high meat diet is not good for us. I mean, the number one killer in America, number one, it's not COVID, it's not cancer, it's heart disease. And we know study after study after study shows, essentially, the more meat you eat, the more likely you're going to have heart disease. And yet, it doesn't really stop anybody from eating meat, knowing that. Um, maybe it stops some people who have had a heart attack and they've been told by their doctor that they need to. But most people are, are walking around with high cholesterol and uh, they're fiber deficient. And nobody is thinking about meat there. 
Yeah, I, I have a I have a slightly different experience of uh, like EPA, FDA. It's I mean, uh, there's a great book by um, uh, Aaron Brockovich, and she put out. It's called Superman's Not Coming. It's really speaking to the quality of water that mm. uh, that we're drinking, and it turns out like people have to get really sick before the EPA steps in. And so industry mm. can launch things and they sort of like test the water on the population. And then it's not until like after the fact. So like just to throw that sort of idea around its head, if industry knew that antibiotics, like all like the, the crappy grains that they're not supposed to be consuming or like the GMO stuff that's maybe not helping the animals thrive or the antibiotics that they're giving them, like it's not a surprise. We know this. Well, why aren't they shutting it down now? You know what I mean? Or mm. why didn't they shut down 10, 15 years ago? So like, there's so many different ways to look at FDA yeah. and regulation, but I think like, that's not really where the interesting part of this conversation is. I think it's like, what kind of utility can we implement so we can offload some of the known stressors, like whether it be like the farmland that we're having to create or, you know, like the use of these drugs and therapeutics in these animals, just so we can like, grow fast so we can get rid of them real quick in, the, in a factory farming scenario. I, I personally won't rely on, you know, a government regulating agency to, to, to finally tell me what's okay. I'm more interested in seeing like, what's the application and are we actually seeing, you know, significant changes as a result of making new choices and better choices? Um, yeah. Well, certainly there've been some times where they've messed up. Um, you know, like the widomide was approved and totally. it out, uh, you know, it wasn't safe. So I'm not saying yeah. there's like a perfect track record, um, but we'll see. I mean, I, I think that David is right that a lot of people are going to be happy to get this. And um, uh, I've eaten it many times myself. Yeah, tell, uh, us, I am, tell us about yeah. your experience. Uh, sure. So, you know, I, in 1993, I made the decision to become vegan. Uh, now, nearly 30 years later, here I am still alive, still living as a vegan. Um but I have eaten cultivated meat on several occasions. And my purpose in becoming vegan was essentially to prevent cruelty to animals. And so, of course, when you're producing real meat that doesn't involve harming animals, it's no big deal for me to eat it. So the first time I ever ate it was in 2014. I was at a company, Nick, that you had mentioned called Modern Meadow in New York. And now they're just working on cultivated leather. But at the time, they were also making like cultivated beef chips. And... Uh, the owner of Modern Meadow at that time, the CEO, his name is Andrew Sforgox, he uh, offered me this beef chip. Now, even at that time in 2014, I've been over two, 20 years of being vegan. Like here, I'm being offered beef. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what am I going to do? And I want to be rude. Like this, this guy's my host. He's offering this to me. I knew like rationally that it wasn't uh, harming an animal, but like, you know, emotionally, I felt pretty conflicted on it. But I also knew this was a really special opportunity. You know, this is worth a lot of money. And at that time, more humans had gone into space than had ever eaten a piece of meat grown outside of an animal. And so I was like, hey, you know, when in Brooklyn, right? And so uh, I put it on my tongue and it definitely gave like a beef flavor. And my mouth was watering and I ate it. And, you know, I've read like accounts of longtime vegetarians who eat meat and they've always had so different reactions. Sometimes it's one of disgust and they vomit. Other times it's like really euphoric for them. I don't have anything like that. I, I basically had like a taste of good. I kind of wish he had given me more than he did. Um, and that was it. But since then, um, in the last eight years since then, I've eaten cultivated uh, beef, chicken, duck, liver, uh, foie gras, chorizo, uh, even just this past week, I enjoyed uh, cultivated salmon. Um, so like, I've been very fortunate, uh, even though these products aren't for sale, these companies, by the fact that I wrote this book, are happy to give me samples of it so I can uh, write it accurately about it. And so I've enjoyed it every time. I, in fact, I think that I might have eaten more a greater diversity of species of cultivated meat than any human on the planet. I think. I'm not sure of that, but I think it may be true. <laughs> That's a, that's a Guinness uh, record. Yeah, right there. That, that's yeah that, that, you should be in the book like, for that. <laughs> thank you. I, I hope I make it. Um, yeah, I just, by the way, it's like totally an aside, but uh, for people who have kids, you might be interested in this. I just read a story this week about this kid um, from the country of Colombia, where he just set the Guinness Book of World Records for solving three Rubik's Cubes while juggling them. So this dude, oh, wow. this kid, that's he's amazing. like 10 years old. He's like 10 years old and he's juggling. And every time it goes through, he's taking his thumb and just moving it over and over. And he did it in minutes. Yeah, I watched the video. My mind was blown. It was insane. 
Well, clearly, my parenting skills with my kids are just not up to par. <laughs> my goodness. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. You think your kid, you think your kid is good because they can spell. This kid is doing really good things while juggling them. That's, That's amazing. Sad. Damon, go ahead, buddy. Well, no, my parenting skills are slacking, man. After that <laughs> yeah. story. Yeah. Um, so let's talk, man. Um, what does this look like? I mean, you've eaten a lot of these foods. Have you had a chance to kind of walk through these labs and see how they're doing these things and get to really see the process there? And let's talk a little yeah. bit about that, like the actual process of them growing these tissues. And, and Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's pretty cool. So like imagine, uh, so I mentioned with each just, so they took a, a chicken feather, but most of the time they're taking like a biopsy. It's like a sesame seed sized biopsy of muscle from an animal, right? It's tiny, tiny, tiny little biopsy. But in that sesame seed sized biopsy, there's millions of what are called satellite cells. These are cells whose their sole job in life is to create more muscle. They're in your body, they're in my body, they're in your dog's bodies and cows and chickens and pigs bodies. And so let's say you get injured, you get bruised, they go to work and they repair your muscle tissue. Do a hard workout, you got a bunch of micro tears, they go to work, produce more muscle tissue. Their only career path in life is to create new muscle. And so when you take them out of that little biopsy and you put them inside of a cultivator where the same temperature as what they'd be in the body is present, the same pH, and you're feeding them similar types of nutrients, all of a sudden they think they're still in the body and they do what they do best, which is grow more muscle. That's the basic gist of how you create these products. You create that you take the cells that would become muscle anyway and just let them grow outside of the body. And so the things that are being fed are, are very simple. It's like simple sugars and so on. Um, and you put them in there and you can harvest out real meat. It, it's really miraculous. It, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's like a, truly a, a, like a miracle to see that this technology works. And what type, of, what type of medium is being used to feed these cells, these nutrients? Like I'm trying to paint a picture in my head of what that looks like. Uh, yeah, so it's different per company and it's different in the past. So uh, it used to be that companies use these very expensive media. Now they've moved to cheaper ones that are made from more simple carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. But it's, you know, you're basically taking, it's not like, you know, you think about a cow, they're eating corn. You're not just putting kernels of corn in there, um, but you're going to take like pieces of corn that create certain types of amino acids and so on that end up being uh, beneficial for the growth of those muscle cells. So and that's the way that you do it. And in the end, you can make all of these products and you can not only take those animal cells and turn them into things like meat or um, uh, liver and so on, but you can do really interesting things and create novel culinary experiences that nobody has ever enjoyed before. So, you know, think about it like this. Like if, if you imagine the time after cows are domesticated, when people were drinking milk, but nobody had yet invented cheese. Nobody had figured out how to make milk curdle yet. And so in that time, people were drinking cow's milk, but they had never even fantasized about Gouda or Brie or Swiss or cheddar or any other cheese that people love to eat today. Yet today, cheese is an everyday experience for a lot of people. Uh, but you know, prior to that time, it was not even fantasized about. It was not dreamt about. Nobody had ever contemplated cheese because it was a novel food. Now people eat it all the time. Um, so what novel foods, what novel culinary experiences may be made possible by this type of an invention? Sure, we can make burgers and sausages just like the way that we have today. But what if you could do really cool things? What if you could grow like co like co culturing? I don't know, chicken, turkey, and duck cells together and have a real turducken. Not like a turducken where you're, you know, stuffing the chicken inside of the duck inside of the turkey, but you co-culture the cells together. Or maybe you'll have like a, a you, you know, a restaurant that instead of just brewing their own IPA in the back is brewing their own local sustainable meat right there in the back. Or maybe you're going to go to your friend's house and, you know, today she might have like an ice cream maker or a bread maker on the counter. But what if she has a meat maker? And just takes like, you know, she orders little uh, tea bags full of stem cells, puts them in and can grow meat right on the counter. Like that would be awesome. That's the type of future I would love to live in and where people can basically eat all the meat they want without doing so much harm. It's fascinating. And there's a part in your book where you kind of got into the milk and, you know, you could culture things without the lactose, without maybe the casein, some of the other components that are causing disruption for people. I mean, so, and then like even combining plant-based stuff and, and animal-based stuff, it, it literally sounds like a chemistry class or something on the Jetsons where, you know, you remember those little pills, here's turkey dinner. Yeah. And then, you know, oh, here comes some mashed potatoes. Wow. Like, 
it's yeah. it's so hard to wrap our heads around but but it is interesting to see where it's already being implemented like you mentioned something in your book around just the production of cheese where they had to use specific animal products but because of innovation and culturing and different things they're able to make cheese in a different way um yeah so so it is interesting to see where it's already being applied and it's everything that we are learning is giving us a little bit more agency to do to implement into these newer newer areas but that um that hybrid yeah. animal sounds totally wacky to me but <laughs> yeah it sounds that sounds pretty cool to me i'd love to eat that but yeah, I'll tell you something funny about the Jetsons that you mentioned, Nick. So I have a line in the book about how this is seen kind of like a Jetsons type technology. Um, and the book has been translated into numerous other languages. And normally when they translate the book, they're just translating the words. But it was brought to my attention that uh, many people in Asia have no idea who the Jetsons are. And so they had to like actually not just translate the book in that particular point, but actually change the type, change the wording to make it more comprehensible to an Asian audience. Because the book is like a Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and so on. And apparently they don't know who the Jetsons are. So uh, it was like a funny, interesting thing about uh, learning about uh, translations uh, for me. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I mean, I think this is a great thing to do for the planet because it can really slash humanity's footprint on the planet. Uh, but I also think it'll open up a lot of really interesting culinary experiences that most people just have never fantasized about. Well, the the faux gras, um, that that whole industry. I mean, what a what a. I mean, again, another entry point, right? So, which is basically like they they take these ducks, they they tube feed them, and and basically they're just hooked up to a feeding tube most of their lives, so they can fatten up their liver, and then they extract the liver, and that becomes this delicacy. You know what what a great example of where you can again disrupt you know some of these practices that are like drastically inhumane you know and, right. and, and have these delicate. yeah i mean yeah i think even the way that you put it is like kind of sugarcoating it like it's not just a tube they take a pipe and they shove it in these birds throats and force feed them multiple times a day to artificially fatten their liver and this is considered by some to be a delicacy. It's also criminal animal cruelty in a lot of places, including where I live in California, where it's yeah. illegal. Uh, more than a dozen nations have banned this. In California, it's not even legal to sell it, let alone to produce it. And in New York City, they banned the sale of it uh, starting later this year as well. And so imagine if people really like this food, which you know, seems like people who eat foie gras really like it. Well, why not produce foie gras without having to torture animals? Uh, it seems a pretty good idea to me. And so I, I tried cultivated foie gras. It was delicious. It melted on my tongue. I've never eaten foie gras from a force-fed bird, but the foie gras that I ate, which was from cultivated uh, duck liver cells, you know, I'll tell you, it was pretty enjoyable. I got, mm -hmm. I got to admit. That means, yeah, I mean, as, as we're talking, I can just see like, you know, there's, I'm just trying to imagine the listener, you know, the, the things that they're thinking about and trying to ask, ask the, the questions that they would have. Like uh, David did bring up some, but what do you, is there any, um, what are some of the other like pushback, I guess, that, that maybe, is there anything that we haven't talked about from a pushback point of view or, or a myth busting point of view you think is important for people to, to appreciate? Or do you think we hit most of them? Is it, did we lose them? I'm still here. I thought he was asking you, David. Are you asking me? No, 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 <laughs> yeah, he's asking you, Paul. Oh, I thought yeah, you were getting ready to do a dad yeah. joke or something. No, no, no. no I'm so sorry. I thought, David, I'm sorry, man. I thought he was asking you the question. No, I was like, yeah, I was, I, I, I was about to tell Nick. I think we lost David. Um, <laughs> okay, so sorry, myth busting. Okay, well, of course, there's all types of myths, but I mean, I think there's myths about, you know, so many things. I mean, in fact, it just, if, just by way of background, like, think about right now all the things that people think about food, many, much of which is wrong. Even MSG, which was like the boogeyman for so long, it turns out is actually better for you than table salt. Like MSG is not any worse for you than table salt. And in fact, it has less sodium per ounce than table salt does. And all the things that you heard like 10, 15, 20 years ago about MSG that it you know, caused all these problems, there's no evidence of it. There's no actual evidence of it. It's just people believe it and it's like this myth. And so I hate to like promote things that are uh, and then debunk them because I don't want to put the myth in the mind of the of the listener in the first place. But I'll, I'll say this, like, you know, there are some people who just feel like, you know, for whatever reason, a sense of discomfort with this. They feel a sense of discomfort because it's different from what they've done. And they have like a sense of neophobia, you know, basically.
basically like a feeling of, of being afraid of things that are new. But over time, that tends to fade away. And that is evidenced by so many things in our lives. So I'll give you, go back to the cheese example. You know, for thousands of years, the only way people had to make milk curdle was with rennet. Rennet comes from calf's intestines. The only way you could get cheese to, to make, get milk into cheese was you had to uh, culture it in, basically with, um, in a cow's intestine, in a calf's intestine, actually. Well, in the early 1990s, we figured out how to synthesize chymosin, which is the enzyme that's functional in red. And now most cheese that we eat comes from a different type of practice. Instead of calf intestinal linings, we basically, you know, you have these companies that are uh, engineering bacteria to produce chymosin. You put that chymosin into the cheese. It does the same thing that a calf's intestine would do, but it's without having to use the calf's intestine. It's much more humane and much more sustainable. Well, you know, there's some people who at first were really discontent by this. They're saying, hey, well, for thousands of years, this is how we've been doing it. Why should we change? Is this safe? Is this chymosin safe? Now, you know, the vast majority of cheese that's sold is made through fermentation produced chymosin. And nobody thinks about it. Nobody talks about it. Nobody even has ever even heard of it. Despite the fact that, keep in mind, this is a genetically engineered microbe to, that is designed to synthetically produce Chymosin. There's nothing unsafe about it. There's no evidence that it's unsafe, and millions of people eat cheese with this product in it all the time. Um, but you know, you say it that way, and all of a sudden, it seems kind of freaky, and people just get a sense. It's kind of like how if you say, you know, uh, I, I found out that a, a restaurant was utilizing uh, dihydrogen monoxide in their food, and you get upset, even though dihydrogen monoxide is just H two O. Or if you find out that a restaurant was secretly putting sodium chloride on your food, which of course is just table salt. Um, so, you know, I, I just think like there's some people who just have a kind of like a fear of science in general. Like they want science in their phones and they want science even in their clothing to have like lightweight clothing that's still warm or that wicks away sweat and so on, even though it's very unnatural. But there's some people who just don't really want science in their food. And I think that is a, a tougher nut to crack because people have this feeling that you know what was done in the past is better than what will be done in the future and in some cases maybe that's true but in some cases maybe it's not and i think in the case of of slaughtering animals for food clearly it's not well you've presented such amazing information and, and so much to ponder you know i every time i i tune into your book i was always left just thinking about you know where this lands and and i think you know, some of what David was speaking to before, you know, the, it's not just something you wear, it's something that becomes a part of your cellular makeup. And so, and I think that's why it really hits people on this deeper energetic yeah. physical level. And there's such a, a pressure, I think, of, of guilt about, you know, for some, but whether they're aware of it or not, just around, you know, we have these, we, we, we started this conversation with companions and pets and, and what makes them different than the, the turkey, the rooster, the chicken, the, the, the cow, wh whatever. I mean, to, to some of these farmers, they, there's such a tight bond with, with their, their animals that they do take to slaughter. And no doubt that, that energetic imprint will linger with people. And so having these conversations, though challenging, sometimes they're challenging to hear. Uh, and I know there was parts of me even just reading the book. I was like, I was really, it was, it was breaking down paradigms. Because when, if I just said, or if I just heard that oh, Paul Shapiro wrote a book about low, uh, growing lab-grown meat, I would have said, well, that's, that's, too, that's too far out of my paradigm. I'm not interested. But because uh -huh. we, we got a chance to have a conversation with you, I was really invested in, in wanting to learn as much as I could about it. Because here's someone who's really, you're, you're, you're bringing this information out for people to really chew on, you know, pun intended. Nice. And and to really <laughs> fist pump and to be able to actually sit with it because these are really important questions. This is, this is our future. It's our kids' future. It's our planet's future. We have to be able to have conversations like this. So, you know, Paul, nice. thank you so much. Um, where can people get your book, find out more about you, please share away so that people can get their hands on your uh, copy of this book. That's very kind of you. I'll tell you in a moment, but before we adjourn, I'll tell you my favorite joke. All right. So <laughs> there is this Christian missionary and he is walking on the plains of Africa, looking for people to convert. And all of a sudden his spine tenses. He gets very uncomfortable. He looks over his shoulder. His worst nightmare is realized. <laughs> <laughs>
there's a lion stalking him. He gets very nervous. He starts walking. The lion starts walking. He starts jogging. The lion starts jogging. He starts running. The lion starts running. And this missionary knows he has no chance. He only can do only one thing. He looks to the heavens and he says, please, Lord, please let this be a Christian lion. And the next thing you know, the lion drops to his knees and you hear him saying, dear Lord, I thank you for this meal that was prepared for me. <laughs> there you go. All right. Where, where can you get the book? Well, uh, well, I appreciate that very much. I love what you guys are doing. I'm grateful to you. So in short, here's the deal. You can get my book, Clean Meat, from anywhere books are sold, including Amazon or anywhere else. But the book's official website is cleanmeat.com. Again, that's cleanmeat.com. Com. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can do that through that website as well. I would welcome hearing from you and love to hear what you think. Even if you think that it is um, crazy, that's fine. Tell me you think it's crazy. I'd love to hear from you. So get in touch. Thank you. That's awesome, Paul. And you can find oh, him on Instagram, Instagram too. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Brad. This was a good yeah. conversation. I am on the gram. Thank you, yeah. David. Thank you, Nick. Really appreciate both of you. Yeah, I appreciate you too, guys. All right, have a beautiful day. We'll see you guys on a, another episode. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'd love to hear from you. So if you, you know, to, to Paul's point, if you if this really jived with you, if it really resonated with you, if it really triggered you, we want to hear from you. Let us know what you think. Uh, what does your future look like in a world with or without me? If we want to know. All the best, everybody. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's podcast, please be sure to subscribe to the Dr. Dads and share with your family and friends. You can also follow and interact with Dr. Nick and Dr. David on Facebook and Instagram for a daily dose of inspiration and the latest in health and wellness. Be well.